Okay. All right. I think we're good to go. So we're going to talk really fast because uh, we just got, we thought we had 45 minutes and we only have 40. My name is Diane Mueller. I'm with Red Hat. On the, uh, I'm the community manager for OpenShift, the uh, platform as a service project. And my colleague here is Daniel Hansen. He is from Cisco. And he is an engineer who's been working on our next generation of OpenShift. And we're going to talk today about deploying OpenShift, a platform as a service, on OpenStack using Heat and Docker and Kubernetes in 39 minutes or less. So we've got some work to do here. So today's um, agenda is pretty quick, pretty clear why infrastructure as a service is not enough when you're delivering um, your clouds. What is PaaS I'm going to cover? We're going to talk about how to deploy OpenShift on OpenStack today. So the current version, the current release of OpenShift um, and all of its flavors and how you can do that with V2. And I'm going to do it really quickly and do a, maybe a few witty one-liners. And then we're going to switch over and we're going to give you an, a quick overview of Docker, of um, Google Kubernetes, both open source projects that are really rock um, OpenShift v3. And we're going to give you a demo of that. And then we're going to give you all the tools to go off and get started with OpenShift v3 on OpenStack today. So the important stuff, I told you who we are, why we love OpenStack. We love open source. I'm the community manager. We are really looking forward. We have a couple of other presentations that other Red Hat folks are giving. I'm giving another one tomorrow on um, cross-community collaboration. We've done some great work with the Heat team on, on OpenStack to make the templates available for OpenShift, both origin and enterprise. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, all of our cool stuff is on GitHub. Um, you'll, we'll show the links to that stuff and move through that um, pretty quickly so that you know where to find all the resources. You can always follow me at Python DJ on Twitter, and I will send you the URLs. If you look on Twitter now under Python DJ, you'll see that I tweeted out the link to this presentation. So if you'd like to follow along with that presentation, the URLs up top. This is a Reveal JS one. We'll tweet out the, the link to that again after the presentation. So some of the assumptions I have here, I'm not going to explain um, OpenStack today, so you've got to be all OpenStack savvy. You know a little bit about Heat. I'll talk a little more about it. You're either a developer or an operations person, person or both. Um, you know what GitHub is. Everybody know what GitHub is? All right, good. I'm not going to explain that one. Um, and you've heard about Docker? Everybody heard about Docker? Yes, good. Um, optional skills are Git, Docker. Anyone? Play with Kubernetes yet? A couple of you, yay. Um, anybody program in Go? Oh, even better. I'm not going to explain Go. Um, suffice to say that Origin v3, v2, uh, the, the um, open source version pers, uh, project, was all a Ruby and Rails app. And v3, we've rewritten the entire thing in Go. So I'm really happy as a Python programmer to get out of the Ruby world. but. Some of the Ruby people aren't so happy about that. So one of the reasons that you would put a platform as a service on um, infrastructure as a service is really that the extra special sauce that um, platform as a service brings to the, to the table for your developers and for your people in operations trying to keep your developer community happy is that we add that middle layer beyond just the compute resources. So if you put it on one put a platform as a service, you'll be able to deploy and automate the entire LAMP stack for your applications. You'll be able to deploy your uh, applications faster in a more standardized way. You'll be able to be more flexible. You'll be able to give your developers and your development teams the testing and QA environments and the different languages that they, they're looking for to use uh, and a way to do that that allows you to, to deliver all that in a multi-tenant elastic way so that the applications can scale up and scale down on demand, that the developers can service themselves, they can do self-service for those resources. Um, and really, a lot of the reason why you would put a platform as a service on top of OpenStack is because developers expect that kind of functionality today. They don't expect just to have to get an instance, build their own LAMP stack, and make that all happen and manage that. They really expect that level of automation so they expect now to be able to take their credit card, go to a public cloud, and get a LAMP stack, deploy an application. And if you're building an on-premise private cloud, 
your development team, your QA team, your test teams, all expect to have that kind of level of automation available to them. So as I said, really infrastructure as a service is not enough. You're just getting the, service, the servers in the cloud. You're building and you're, and you're on the hook still for building and managing everything right down to the OS, to the app servers, to the database. And platform as a service really um, makes that into an automated way. If you're just delivering software as a service, people can combine those and integrate those. And we have some offerings that allow you to do that, XPaaS and cloud forms and other things. But um, you're really restricted to only using those services that are, are available to you. So really, platform as a service, in, in my humble opinion, is really the secret sauce in the cloud. It's what makes the development and the agility to bring new products to market quickly and to be able to scale them and leverage um, all the ease and scale and power of the cloud um, very rapidly and make that done in a way that's compliant and easy to manage from an ops point of view and easy to self-serve from a developer's point of view. So with OpenShift, there's three flavors of OpenShift. There's OpenShift Online, so if you go to openshift.com, you can play with everything that we're gonna talk about today, and we do it, we eat our own dog food. We host, and we have over two million apps deployed on OpenShift, the public cloud version of it. Um, and we also have an enterprise version, but the part that I'm really happy with, at, because I'm the community manager, is that everything that we use in the public cloud and in our enterprise project product is available in OpenShift Origin, the online project, and all of that is in GitHub. So if you wanted to go and deploy it today on RHEL, on CentOS, or on Fedora, you could do that. So what can you do with OpenShift? Well, you can do just about anything you can imagine with OpenShift. You can deploy all the languages that you, you'd expect. I, if I tried to jam them all in here, you'd um, not be able to read this thing, but it runs on OpenStack, it does run on AWS, it runs on bare metal, it runs on Rev, um, it runs on um, any RHEL or CentOS or Fedora, um, and it basically deploys the entire LAMP stack, all of the ser database services and everything you need to get, s to get your applications running on the cloud. So how does it work? I'm gonna be really quick about this. It's basically, it's taking that, um, the, the management interface or the broker, and I'm gonna switch. So it's taking, um, it creates a broker, and you need to know this in order to understand what we're actually deploying onto um, OpenStack. So when you look at the heat templates, you'll figure this out. With V2, what you're getting is a broker, a messaging, um, ActiveMQ, and a node in which the cartridges and your actual applications live in. So we've got two types of things that we have to deploy using heat. So a little bit about heat. Um, we've done some great work with the heat team, Steve Dake, uh, Chris Alfonso, and a number of other folks um, have done some wonderful work creating the heat templates. They're all up there in GitHub. Um, some of them are in the GitHub repo for um, OpenStack, and some of them are in the enterprise ones are in the OpenShift repo. So what we've done is taken the everything you need to deploy both the brokers and the nodes and put them into heat templates. And that allows us to spin up, um, register things with Glance, spin up the compute nodes and scale them and make them run um, with all the authentication cap capabilities. So we'll do all that HA stuff. And I'm trying to do this all in 10 minutes or less, all right? So you have all the time you need. Um, so the origin heat templates for Fedora and for um, uh, CentOS are in OpenStack heat templates here. They're easy to find. And this is all the stuff for V2. And, and all the stuff for the enterprise version is all in GitHub. It's all open source. It's easy to run. So if you've got heat installed on your OpenStack, you should be able to run these right out of the box. And you can watch a wonderful YouTube at your leisure here. And um, I've tweeted out these links as well, and you can watch this whole thing run and do it. But instead of doing that today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about a new PaaS, a new generation of platform as a service. So um, one of the reasons you might ask is, why do we need to do a new version of, of OpenShift? Well, how many of you are using Docker? Everybody loves Docker. Um, we've got change, become a new era of um, tooling, Kubernetes was open sourced by Google, so we wanted to take advantage of that. We, we learned a lot from deploying those two million apps on openshift.com, 
and we wanted to incorporate that and put out the next generation of OpenShift. And one of the wonderful things about working um, in the open source world is we get to work with great people like Cisco um, and Danyan, who actually on V2 did all of the HA puppet scripts to make um, the HA capabilities built into V2. So if you're using any of the install.openshift.com puppet scripts for V2, you're using work done by um, Cisco and donated and, and pulled right back into the project. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step aside and let Danyan talk about all the work that Cisco is doing and introduce V3 as opposed to me talking about it. So Danyan, take it away. Thanks, Diane. Everyone hear me okay? I don't know if this thing's working. Oh, here we go, that's better. Uh, as Diane mentioned, uh, V3, the, the newest version of OpenShift that is still under heavy development, it's considered alpha, uh, has gone through a major, major architecture change uh, all the way from the language that it uh, is programmed in from Ruby uh, to Go. And, um, and so as part of the architecture change, there's a lot of tools within the architecture that have changed as well. Um, and one of the first tools is how uh, the applications within the PaaS system are being isolated from one another. Uh, previously, there was a technology or, or a language called uh, cartridges. Uh, that use uh, SE Linux and C groups and, and so forth to, to isolate those applications within the platform. Uh, the V3, or, or the newest version of OpenShift, again, still under uh, heavy development, uh, is using Docker, leveraging Docker. And so to understand what Docker is all about, we, uh, you know, let's just really quickly talk about what containers are. They're a form of isolating um, you know, applications and the application dependencies like configuration files and libraries uh, from one another, right? So uh, if we look at virtual machines, we were able to isolate virtual machines from one another all the way down to basically the hardware driver level. Uh, with containers, it's an isolation approach that allows us to take a single uh, kernel or operating system and then isolate applications and, and those application dependencies um, from one another. And um, so uh, part of that uh, isolation mechanism is that Docker or containers leverage uh, kernel facilities like C groups and namespaces to create that isolation amongst the applications. Um, and part of uh, the way that Docker is able to do this is um, is using Docker images, right? And so Docker images and what Docker does is it takes, um, it takes the file system and traditionally in a root file system, it will go ahead and um, the kernel will mount the root file system as read only, do its checks, and then turn it over to a read write uh, file system. What uh, Docker does is instead of changing that to a read write file system, it mounts a union file system so that we can have multiple file systems on top of that um, root file system. So I kind of think of it as like a layered cake. And so when you create your Docker images, you're creating an image based off of a base image. That base image is a read-only image. If you, if you go ahead and make any changes to that read-only image, uh, those changes you make within your image um, are now read-write within your image. You never change any of the contents within that read-only image. So Docker images, I, I uh, say this is it's more like Git than tar, right? So we can go ahead and pull and push images. Uh, we could tag and version them. And uh, from a developer standpoint, developers love Git. So you could imagine uh, when Docker came around with this image concept that uh, developers very quickly embraced uh, Docker images as well. So you know, here's just uh, what it kind of looks like if I want to go ahead and and pull, so I take a host, I install Docker on that host, and I immediately could go ahead and start pulling down uh, Docker images from, uh, from Docker Hub, the central public registry. Um, I could also push an image, so I go ahead and I create my own image, or I, I have pulled an image, I've made some changes, now I wanna push that image back up uh, to Docker so that if I wanna go ahead and pull down that image somewhere else, it's available. And again, that kind of talks about the power of the workflow of Docker is being able to push and pull those images down. So if I develop on my desktop, I make some changes, 
go ahead and push those changes up to my image sitting on, on Docker Hub, and then I'm able to go to a, a production system and pull those, uh, the, that uh, recent image down. Uh, version and tag, so I go ahead and take an image. Um, I make some changes to it and say, hey, let me go ahead and tag this as something um, that's useful. Um, so I could go ahead and keep the existing image the way it is, and now I've got an image just like that, but with my changes, but just with a different tag. And then some, just some typical operations of containers. Uh, I go ahead and run the container. I could use different flags like the I and the T and actually get a, a, you know, go right into a bash shell uh, within my container. I could list my containers using the PS-L. Um, I can diff a container. So I go ahead and run a container, again, make some changes, and I walk away, have lunch, come back, and I say, oh, what did I change? What were my changes uh, running on my container from that uh, image that I went ahead and uh, ran that container from? I ran, run a diff on it, and I could see that when I did a w, install wget, it made all these changes to that, uh, to that image. I could run my container as a daemon. That's typically how, uh, how containers are run uh, using the dash D flag. I could also uh, add the dash P flag to my Docker run. And what that does is it basically tells Docker, hey, Docker, go ahead and map ports, the dash P is the ports. So here I've got a container, uh, my Nginx container that uh, is running, and it's listening on port 80 of that container. Well, now I want to go ahead and map that port 80 on the container to the host, right? So the rest of the world can, can hit that container on, a, you know, on an IP address and the port that they're expecting. So here's all the cool things that Docker does, right? Portability, pushing and pulling images. Um, so I can go from developing on my laptop to a test dev environment to a production environment simply by pushing and pulling all the way through. Um, and that really aligns with the workflow, right? So developers love that workflow of being able to push and pull and tag uh, images, um, diff images, so on and so forth. Really easy to use. I take a host, virtual machine, whatever it may be, install Docker, and uh, very quickly can pull down an image and run a container. So I can go from a standard host to, uh, to a, a Docker engine running an Nginx container within literally a, a few minutes. And then speed, because I'm not, you know, typically uh, these Docker images uh, are very lightweight. Uh, so it makes it very easy for me to, to run or, or pull and push images very quickly. Um, you know, part of that is a union file system, right? So if I make a change to an image and push that, those changes up to Docker Hub, I'm not pushing a, an entire image, let's say it's 500 meg, I'm just basically diffing, right? I'm diffing those changes between my original image and the changes that I made, and Docker, when I do that Docker push, it's gonna go change by change and say, oh, let's go ahead and only push these changes up. So what Docker doesn't, it, I mean, it's, it's really was developed as, um, you know, a host type of solution, right? There's, uh, Docker doesn't have this concept of how can I manage and orchestrate hundreds or thousands to tens of thousands of containers across hundreds or thousands of, of hosts across tens to hundreds of data centers. Um, I can't go ahead and bring containers that I would want to maybe operate together and manage those containers as a coordinated group. So let's bring in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is an open source project that Google um, open sourced, uh, I want to say about four months ago. Um, you know, Google's uh, been using containers for over 10 years. I believe they're saying that they're um, you know, starting up and shutting down millions of containers uh, a week. And so they know a thing or two about containers. And uh, what Kubernetes does is it's uh, pretty much a cluster manager so that um, it's a cluster manager for clustering and managing uh, uh, con containers. And so in Kubernetes terms, there's a concept of a pod. And a pod is a collection, one or more containers that you would want to have together on a single host, right? Um, in this example, we see pod one with a C1 and C2. 
right? So C1 could be my Apache container, and it's running my Apache process, my Apache configuration files, any other uh, libraries. And then C2 could be a service that I normally tie together with the Apache service. Maybe it's a, a log rolling service, um, a data lo loading service, something like that. Whenever, I, when, whenever in my environment I go and, and run Apache, I want to make sure that, that this other service is together. Uh, I bring them together, and, and that forms a pod. And, and it makes it a, a nice unit of management because um, if you're hearing the term of microservices, right, so taking containers and instead of treating a, a container like a virtual machine where we take one container and load up a bunch of different services on it, it's taking a container or what you'd normally have in your application and containerizing each of those services and then grouping those services together, those common services, into pods. There's a concept of a label so that I could go ahead and take a bunch of these pods, you know, in a, in, in a large environment, I may have hundreds of thousands of pods, but I may say, wait a second, let's start managing these pods more effectively. I'm gonna take and take these pods and they're gonna be my front end pods, so I'm gonna put a label called front end. Well, I'm gonna even further manage those and say, within that, uh, that pod or the grouping of pods called front end, I have um, test dev, I have, uh, production, so different environment labels. So I could stack all these labels together and taking all those labels, it allows me to manage uh, these pods so that I don't have uh, pod sprawl. And then um, all the different services that make up Kubernetes um, can be you know, bundled into two, typically into two different scenarios. One could be your master and another collection of services is your minion or your node. Your master, think of that as your control plane. So within OpenStack uh, terminology, this is your controller node, right? And uh, the minion, think of that as your worker bee, right? So the, the master is talking to the minion saying, um, fire up this pod, tear down this pod. Another big piece of Kubernetes is etcd, and etcd is a highly available distributed uh, key value store, and uh, it's used for shared configuration management. Uh, so I can go ahead and define um, something. I could define a label. That label's maybe foo equals bar. Well, I define that within my master, the master stores that on etcd, and now any of my minions is aware of that particular label. So one of the minion daemons is called the kubelet, right? And if you think about the kubelet, uh, what that does is think of it as like a translator between the Kubernetes world and Docker, right? So uh, the, the, kubelet, the kubelet will take your pod definition and it will go ahead and talk to Docker and fire up the containers necessary within that pod. Or if I remove that pod definition, I say kubi config delete pod XYZ, it's gonna go tell that kubelet, hey, uh, run the Docker commands necessary to remove that container from this Docker host. Uh, another daemon is a kubi proxy. Think about the kubi proxy as like a, a distributed virtual uh, load balancer, right? So I go ahead and create these pods. I now want to expose uh, one of the services from the pod. Again, I've got an, uh, an Apache example, and I say, all right, I've got a bunch of Apache pods. Let me go ahead and now expose uh, Apache on port 80 to the rest of the world, right? Uh, I go ahead and create the service. I use the label that I was talking about to tie the service to the pod, and the Kubernetes uh, API will go ahead and create that service endpoint the, uh, and store that in etcd and the kubi proxies running on all my minions will be aware of it and say oh there's this new endpoint let's go ahead and pull it down and now load balance for this uh, for this service to all the minions um, and so it's uh, you know think of it as a, a load balancer slash service discovery I have these pods I create the service the, the Kubi proxy running on the minions is now aware of it and then exposes it to the rest of the world. And it's just really interesting that that proxy runs on all the minions. So if I've got 100 minions from 
um, you know, 192.168.100 to 200, every single one of them is aware of that service that I create and will load balance. On the back end, it knows about the IP address or IP addresses associated to the containers or the pods. Um, and then it will go ahead and, and front end the proxy to its own IP address. So cluster management, um, you know, I've talked about some of these. This is the Kubi API. Uh, that's basically how clients, users interact with the system. The scheduler, very simplistic now, uh, but uh, is meant to be more extensible in the future. The scheduler basically says, hey, where do I go ahead and run these pods? Uh, throw this pod on minion one, minion two, or minion three. And then the controller manager uh, basically works with the Kubernetes API and it's monitoring the status of those pods. So if I go ahead and say, all right, um, I've got uh, this Apache pod, I want three replicas of it for high availability or scaling that service, and the controller manager will make sure that all the three of those pods are always running. If one is somehow deleted, the controller manager will know about it and say, let's spin that thing back up. If there's, for some reason, four or five of them, it'll say, let's tear those two extra down. And then uh, Kubi CFG, that's just our command line, how to interact with the system. Uh, so Kubernetes does a lot of really awesome things, uh, but there's some things that it doesn't do, right? And so Kubernetes really does a good job at how do I manage containers at scale? It doesn't really look at how do I take an application and manage it through the entire life cycle of that application? How do I take my application source code and turning that into a running application? That, br that uh, brings us to OpenShift, bringing it all together. Right, so if we look at applications, what are they, uh, or what do, they, what do we want them to be in the new era of application development is really distinct interconnected services. We say distinct because with the microservice concept, we want to treat each of the services independently. If we need to patch them, we patch them independently. We do test and dev them independently, but they need to be interconnected because you know, complex applications are groupings of services. And we want to be able to deploy and manage those in concert, but we don't want them tightly coupled. So applications within OpenShift, uh, you know, just some key concepts. Uh, you know, for example, a config. It's a, a collection of objects uh, describing um, you know, what the application is, right? So it would contain our pod or pods, our service or services, our replicas, how many, you know, how many replicas of this particular application do we want? And then the concept of a template, right? This allows us to parameterize our application. And this is kind of what a, a config template looks like. We give it a name, we specify the top level parameters that we want to go ahead and use throughout the application services. And then items that really make up the, uh, the configuration of that application. Uh, and here we just dive down into the parameters. So um, in this top section, we define what the parameter is. Uh, in the template, we go ahead and reference the parameter. And then when we actually process that template into a config, uh, you see that, um, that the environmental variable actually picks up that expression from the template. And then there's also a concept of, of builds or, or build configs within OpenShift v3. And this is a real powerful aspect of OpenShift. Uh, it allows us to take source code and turn that into a running image within our environment, a running Docker image. So it basically interconnects the source code. I'm a developer, I create some source code, and the build config allows me to take that source code and turn it into a running image in the environment. If I make any changes to that source code, I also have the instruments necessary to keep that image updated in my environment. Again, you know, very, uh, I believe a very powerful aspect. And it really goes into this, this slide of, of life cycle. So we can use or leverage triggers to always keep that image updated. My Apache image running in my Kubernetes environment, right? 
it's awesome that I'm able to put that thing there, but three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, am I keeping that updated based on the, the continuous iterations that I'm making to that code base? Um, and then the deployment. The deployment really brings it all together, right? How many replicas do I want? What are my trigger policies? Um, and what's my strategy for deploying the application? Uh, trigger policies, uh, you know, we could either manually trigger saying, hey, go and, and build this now. Uh, I could go ahead and, and trigger it based on a change in the, the image or in the, or in the config file. So very, uh, very powerful as well. Uh, new concepts, uh, just to kind of keep in mind with V3 is, you know, the configurations, the builds, and the deployments. The configurations of the collections of the Kubernetes as well as OpenShift objects, uh, the templates that we use to go ahead and take parameters that we're going to leverage throughout our application, so take those variables and, and parameterize them uh, throughout the application. Uh, the builds, taking the source code and turning it into a Docker image, and then the deployment, how do we actually get this application up and running? So let's actually see what, uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, so I've got, um, I've got an OpenStack Juno cluster, and I'll uh, actually show you. So I've got uh, Juno running on Fedora uh, 20, and what I'm going to do very simply is go from my OpenStack environment all the way to running an application in V3. One of the first things I do is I pull down the Kubernetes uh, templates, the master branch, and I simply put some stuff in the local.yaml, right? Uh, what's my keys that I'm going to use? What are the flavor size? What's the IP addresses I'm going to use? And this Kubernetes heat template is actually a nested template. So, um, so the cluster or the high-level uh, template, uh, it's doing some basic things. It's setting up our Neutron network. It is setting up our, uh, our SSH keys to, uh, to uh, our instance. It's setting up the security. And, um, and also, basically, tying it down to the lower level um, heat YAML template. So the high level template, as well as the node template, right? It's a nested template. And where are we at here? So let me just back up one second. So I believe this is, uh, this is the second template that we're using here. And this configures our Kubi minions, right? Very similar to the, the high level or the cluster template. It's uh, configuring the network for the minions, the security for the minions, and then actually configuring uh, the Nova instances. And within both of these uh, templates, there's a lot going on. Uh, basically, we're using the, the user data parameter within the heat template to install a special repo, um, pulling down certain packages, running some scripts on, um, on the nodes as well. You see that uh, we fired off the uh, heat cluster, and it is building. We could see, take a look at the resource progress and see that uh, it's still building out. And what we're doing now is just seeing that, oh, Nova has uh, fired off these instances. They show active, but let's take a look at the console log and see where they're at. Well, even though they're active, they're still uh, updating their packages, uh, pulling down the latest packages that we need for Kubernetes. Well, now it's complete, so let's go ahead and SSH into our Kubi master. Now that we're in the Kubi master, let's just see, you know, that the packages are actually there. We got the Kubernetes package. We've got the etcd package, really the two core packages uh, on the master. Uh, let's uh, take a look. Can we actually see the minions? Oh, the minions are there. I've got two minions at dot four and dot five. Let's take a look at and make sure that the services, the Kubi API, uh, the Kubi scheduler, the controller master, make sure that they're running, etcd's running, everything so far, yay, heat did what it's supposed to do. Things are looking really sweet. All right, next step in this flow. Now let's pull down another set of files uh, that we're going to use to go ahead and now deploy OpenShift v3 on my Kubernetes cluster. I pull down the files. Um, you, I'm showing you what the files look like. Um, you know, you may want to modify the files if uh, you know if your master and etcd server is at a different IP address. 
but otherwise I go ahead and create that Kubi service, right? So now all the Kubi proxies are proxying port 8083 and sending it to my, uh, my V3 pod or pods. I go ahead and create a pod. You see that uh, it's sitting there waiting. Uh, you know, so Kubernetes is basically saying, oh, Danian wants to create a pod. Let's go ahead and, and schedule these pods out to the minions, download the, uh, the Docker images, and start up the, the necessary Docker containers. Um, it's done that. The pods are ready to go. I've got uh, uh, a container ID, and I go ahead and, and uh, verify that the container looks good. You see that the services are running. Now let me actually get into the container. So I'm going to go ahead and get the container ID, use a tool called nsetter to basically counsel right into, uh, into the container. And I'm in there. Great. So now I'm in my OpenShift v3 environment that's running on Kubernetes that was deployed by OpenShift or by OpenStack Heat. Next thing I'm going to do now that I'm in v3 is, again, pull down some uh, files. And um, I'm going to build build out my Docker registry within my OpenShift v3 environment. OpenShift takes advantage of a private Docker uh, registry. And you see that um, what this file is, it's a config file, what we talked about. It's going to describe what service. So this is kind of like a higher level wrapper, right? Within Kubernetes, we're used to or we're familiar with you know, the pod files, the service files. Well, now we've got the config file that wraps that all together within the OpenShift world. Um, you know, part of the config file is specifying what, you know, what image do I want to use, what ports do I want to expose. Now let's go ahead and fire off that config and it creates those services. The services uh, is being proxied by Kubi proxy. Now I'm going to go ahead and create a build config. You remember I told you about the build configs. What the build config does is it allows us to create that connection between the source code and the Docker image, right? And so it needs some parameters to understand that. What's the URL of the source code sitting on GitHub? Uh, what's the, the tag of the uh, image or the image name that I want to use when I go ahead and, and create that image? I go ahead and create the build config. And now what I'm doing is I'm uh, simulating uh, a webhook, right? And so what this webhook normally does is if I go ahead and I set up a webhook in my GitHub repo, and whenever I make a change, it's going to go ahead and let uh, OpenShift v3 know, hey, something's changed in this source code. That's going to kick off v3 to pull down those changes and, re and rebuild that Docker image. And now I've got an application template. Right, so this is going to be my sample application. And instead of just creating an application config, I'm now using a template. And what I talked to you about just a few minutes ago, with the template, it allows us to parameterize those variables that I want to share within my application. So things like um, admin username and passwords, and maybe um, certain um, configurations within configuration files I could go ahead and parameterize. Um, here's, it includes my pod template. So, you know, what's the name of the container I want to use? What's the image that I'm going to use? And this is where uh, I'm actually consuming those parameters uh, within the template. And now I'm going to go ahead and generate um, a config from the template and also run that config all uh, in a single command. And now you actually see I've got a running application, and it's a simple application, a hello world application. But what I wanted to focus on was that whole process, being able to take an OpenStack deployment, Juno OpenStack deployment, but this should work on Icehouse uh, as well. Uh, how do you take that environment and build out a Kubernetes cluster, run v3, OpenShift v3 on it, and then run an application on top of the v3? So here's where you can go ahead and get started with OpenShift v3, uh, github.com slash OpenShift slash origin. Uh, and it's got a whole getting started guide. Uh, we don't really have much time for questions, but I'll hand it back to, to Diane. Yeah, so thank you very much, Damien. Um, that was awesome. And that, that's the kind of beauty of, of working in an open source community. And we would love you to come and contribute and test out OpenShift Origin v3. It's all in GitHub, all the getting started stuff's there. I'll tweet out the links. 
We're going to be over in the Cisco booth um, right after here if you have questions to Danian or to myself on how to get involved or how to contribute or how to start testing. And if you're interested in running the V2 stuff, we can show you how all that works as well. Um, I'll be in the Red Hat booth all day tomorrow, so please come forward and ask any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Enjoy the show.